Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to talk about organic computing, which involves the creation of living biological hardware or wetware. Now, organic computing is a very new field. Even the name of the field hasn't really settled yet. Here I'm calling it organic computing, but some people talk about biocomputing or biological computing. Some people talk about DNA computing, although DNA computing is really a subset of what I'll be discussing here. Now, I need to stress from the outset that organic computing is at best today highly experimental and some of it is entirely theoretical. But we do know with absolute certainty that organic computing can work. For a start, I'm using an organic computer right now to make this video, and you're all watching it using an organic brain. There are three basic ways in which organic computers may potentially be created. The first is to build a system in which some of the components are natural or artificial living materials. The second is then to utilise DNA as a medium for information storage or information processing. And finally, we could potentially design a new computational entity, artificially fabricate its entire genome, and bioprint or grow a functional biocomputer, potentially in a host animal. Now, it may surprise you to learn that some of these things have already been achieved. For example, in 1999, Professor William Ditto built a working organic computer using neurons obtained from a leech. So what he did is he took the leech, he somehow took out the neurons very carefully, I'm sure, and he took some tiny little electrodes, put them into these neurons, wired it all together, and ended up with a working computer, a device that could add or subtract two numbers, and which became known as the leechulator. Now, at the time, Professor Ditto's ideas, he was working at the Georgia Institute of Technology, his ideas were to build a biocomputer, a brain for a robot, because he had this idea that robots would need very sophisticated brains, and he saw that supercomputers were very large and they were far too big to, to mount on a robot back in 1999, so he thought maybe the solution would be to build biological brains, as he put it, for robots. Now, of course, since 1999, traditional computers, inorganic computers, have shrunk enormously. We've now also got cloud robotics, so robots can have their processing power remote out in the cloud, and therefore, Professor Ditto has moved on to other work. But his initial experiment, building this neuron-based computer using neurons from a leech, is still a milestone in organic computing. Life itself is a computational process. For example, most cells store data in DNA, receive chemical inputs in the form of ribonucleic acid, or RNA, perform logic operations using complex RNA molecules called ribosomes, and produce output by synthesizing proteins. All of the elements required to build an artificial organic computer therefore already exist in natural biology. Building on this understanding, in 2013 a team from Stanford University managed to create a biological transistor or transcriptor using DNA and RNA. Now, in a traditional computer, in traditional electronic circuits, a transistor controls the flow of electrons down a wire, whereas a transcriptor controls the flow of an enzyme down a strand of DNA. And what the Stanford team managed to do, using their transcriptor development, was to build a number of logic gates. So they managed to build some AND gates, and NAND gates, and OR gates, and XOR gates, the basic components we use to build traditional computers. So their work is very significant. It actually, for the first time, showed that we can build traditional computing components, but using organic materials. In addition to using DNA to produce potential organic computing components, some research teams have also started to experiment with it as a storage media. In a strand of DNA, every base pair can store one of the four chemical letters A, C, G or T, which means that in theory each DNA base pair should be able to store two binary bits of information. Now in practice, due to writing errors that occur in natural biology, the actual figure is 1.8 bits of data per DNA base. But this still allows a tremendous quantity of information to be stored in a very small biological space. 
Investigating the possibilities, back in 2012, a team from the Harvard Medical School, led by Professor George Church, managed to encode a 55,000 word genetics textbook into DNA. And even more impressively, in March 2017, a team from Columbia University and the New York Genome Center published this paper, in which they presented a method for storing 215 petabytes of data in one gram of DNA. And that's just extraordinary. 215 petabytes of data is 215 million gigabytes of data stored in one gram of DNA. And that is the highest density data storage solution ever created and illustrates the extraordinary potential of organic computing. A few months ago on this channel, I looked at developments in quantum computing and the idea that future quantum computers will be able to process a great many data possibilities simultaneously. However, such future massively parallel processing may also be delivered by organic computers. And working towards this goal, in March 2017, a team from the University of Manchester published this paper, in which they presented a design for a DNA-based computer which will be able to follow an exponential number of computational paths. And the way they envisage doing this, the approach they're taking, is to use individual DNA molecules as parallel processors, which all start in the same state, but which over time diverge so they can work on a great many different computational possibilities. Now, to get your head around just what this involves, imagine a tank containing a computational soup with billions or trillions of DNA strands, each of which is functioning as a biological microprocessor. Gene editing molecules are also included in the mix, and these gene editing molecules constantly rewrite the DNA strands so each can work on a different potential solution to the problem posed. As the Manchester team explain, such a DNA computer could potentially utilize more processors than all of electronic computers in the world combined, and so could outperform all standard computers when calculating answers to significant practical problems. Right now, the inputs to and outputs from the Manchester team's system are genetic sequences, and these have to be written using synthetic biology tools and read with a genetic sequencer. So there are no direct means of using any standard form of computer or peripheral to program this machine or to get the information out of it. So it's not a practical organic computer, yet we're a long way from having a practical organic computer based on this type of massively parallel processing DNA soup technology. However, the work of the Manchester team is, I think, very significant. It points the way ahead for potentially incredibly powerful organic computers. Having reported on some actual practical organic computing research, Let's consider where this technology may take us in the future. As I said at the start of this video, our brains are organic computers that are naturally grown inside our body. And it's not impossible that in the future we will learn to design and grow comparable artificial organic computers. Such wetware creations may be entire computers in their own right, or there may be biological components that are interfaced with more traditional inorganic circuitry. Such future biochips would need to be sustained with chemical feedstocks rather than an electrical supply, and they may both mature and then degenerate over time. Already, synthetic biology software such as GenoCAD can be used to design artificial DNA molecules, while printers like the BioXP3200 can be used to print them out. In time, we may therefore use such tools to create biocomputer genomes in the lab before cultivating them in nutrient tanks to mature into organic microprocessors. Alternatively, biocomputers may one day be bioprinted from cell aggregates. Now, this I know may sound like pure science fiction. However, commercial bioprinters do already exist, so it's not impossible we'll be bioprinting organic computing hardware in the second half of this century. Alternatively, we may choose to grow entire biocomputers or biochips inside or on a host animal. Now, already we're humanizing pigs with human DNA, so we can use a pig to create an organ for human transplant. 
Now, there's a long way to go between humanizing a pig with human DNA to create that type of organ and producing a biochip or a biocomputer, but potentially we may use an animal like a pig in the future to grow a complete form biochip or bio computer, which we've then removed from the pig. And we might do it in such a way it can be removed from the pig and the pig would survive and we can do it again and again. So we might use an animal as what a synthetic biologist already calls a factory on legs. And it's not impossible in the future that we will alter ourselves to produce biochips and biocomputers. After all, we already know that the best hardware on the planet, the best technology on the planet to actually grow a working biocomputer is a human being. We're the best thing on this planet at creating working viable computers. The best computers on this planet are still human brains. So it may well be that we choose to alter ourselves a bit in the future to grow biocomputers, biochips. Not in our heads, but we might grow them in say artificial wombs, we might grow them with sort of synthetic spinal nodes down our backs. So that some of us in the future may actually have a job which is to personally grow and cultivate biochips and biocomputers. Today, we are not remotely close to possessing the knowledge and the technical skills required to make a useful artificial organic computer. Even so, this doesn't mean we should dismiss the idea of having organic computers in the future. Many times in the history of computing, theory has been well ahead of practice. And indeed, it often takes grand ideas to push technology forward. If you want to know more about organic computing and other future computing issues, you can look at my new book, Digital Genesis, The Future of Computing, Robots and AI. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.